Okay, I'm going to get started, and um, as people come in, they'll uh, catch up. All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Lisa Itzkowitz. I'm from the New Rochelle Public Library, and I'm delighted to see so many people here already. We are partnering um, in presenting tonight's program with seven other Westchester libraries. We have Ardsley Public Library, Hendrick Hudson Free Library, John C. Hart Memorial Library, Lewisboro Library, Poundridge Library, Somers Library, and Yonkers Public Library. So thank you to all my colleagues for partnering on this program, which is going to be presented tonight by our community partner, Healthy Yards of New Rochelle. And we're thrilled to bring this program to such a wide audience. We're all over the county. Um, and I know that our presenter shared it with the Audubon uh, group. So we have, a, we have a nice attendance. Before I turn the program over to Bob Finkelstein from Healthy Yards, who's going to present tonight's speaker, just a few housekeeping items, which is to please keep yourself muted at all times while our presenter is speaking. Um, you're welcome to keep your camera on during the program, but I just want to remind you that if you do that, we can see you, which is fine, but if you're eating dinner or doing <laughs> something else, you may want to turn your camera off and just listen and look. And finally, we'll take questions at the end, but you can put your questions in the chat over the course of um, Carrie's presentation, and at the end, we can um, adjust the questions. And I think that's it. The last thing is I know New Rochelle and all our partner libraries have many programs going on in person, virtual. We all have websites where you can find information. So I'm going to ask all my colleagues to just put the website address in the chat and everyone can see. And, you know, I think many of our libraries, anyone can come to most any program. So feel free to look at other calendars as well. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Bob Finkelstein from Healthy Yards of New Rochelle. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, again, I'm Bob Finkelstein, the co-president of Healthy Yards New Rochelle. And thank you, Lisa, our partner libraries, our Healthy Yards group, and especially Carrie uh, for tonight's presentation. As you will see, Carrie is an avid birder and uh, Ruth Bryan from our steering committee was uh, really great in making this happen along with Lisa and Carrie. So I'd like to read something that Ruth uh, wrote and she is a friend of, of Carrie. Um, Ruth wanted us to know that Carrie has a deep connection to birds and loves to share her knowledge and enthusiasm. She's generous and encouraging towards beginning birders. And Ruth says, when I had the good fortune to be with her on an early morning bird walk and excitedly pointed out something at the top of the tree, she didn't say, oh, that's just a leaf. She said, it's a leaf bird. And that's the kind of person Carrie is. Uh, Ruth said she's always positive and fun to be with. And I think you'll get that as we go through. You'll also see some of her uh, more qualifications uh, and history as we go through the presentation. Um, Carrie did recently retire as a physician's associate at Montefiore, and now she's able to enjoy birding a lot more often and recently had a great trip to Gaspe Peninsula in Quebec, Canada, uh, the Adirondacks and South Africa on birding trips. So it's, it's quite a, an honor to be able to do that. Uh, we're glad that Carrie's agreed to share her knowledge with us about how to make the world a better place uh, for birds and how we can help support that. So without further ado, we'll turn the presentation over to Carrie. And thank you, Carrie. Thank you. And thank you for the library system and thank you for Healthy Yards New Rochelle. And shout out to Salmo River Audubon too with uh, helping me and working with me. Um, so just, I'm gonna be talking about bird-friendly gardens um, and fun ways you can attract birds to your garden. You know, um, I think it's important to have fun, <laughs> as uh, Ruth noted. Um, but what I'm really talking about, too, is that restoring the American landscape in the role of suburban gardens and really creating habitat, backyard habitat. Uh, it's a lot more critical than we understand, and um, I'll be going over that. So 85% of the land uh, east of the Mississippi River is privately owned. 
So we basically need to live in harmony with this natural world that sustains us, uh, maintain plants that promote biodiversity. We really need to help the insects and, and that's what I'll be talking about with the types of plants and such. Be, they're the little things that rule the world. They're critical to the food wave, web and native plants are the key with this whole issue. And not all native plants support equals insects equally, uh, especially caterpillars, but, um, but we'll be talking about that and how basically this is essential land stewardship. And a lot of what we can do to help birds is in our own backyard. So basically um, with conservation, working together by helping thrive, uh, birds thrive and creating and maintaining critical habitat, because what is so important is that um, is that we need places that birds need places to rest and nest and their breeding and their migrations, which all their migratory stops and their winter habitat. Um, and birds and I want to look at birdscapes instead of landscapes. One of the people that's really inspired me is Doug Tallamy. Um, he one of his first books was Bringing Nature Home. And he talks now more and more about creating a homegrown national park. You know, when we combine all of our backyard habitat and, and looking, you know, it's not just um, backyards, it's, you know, businesses and places of worship or schools that we can have bird friendly gardens and working all together with that effort. And there's also talks of, talks of the Bird City uh, Network, which is the same principle of just using any space we can. Even, you know, people often ask me, well, I just live in an apartment. But, you know, there can be areas around your apartment. You can put something on your balcony if you have one or, or, or sometimes just letting vacant lots go. Um, this is all important for bird habitat. And, and this is in your own backyard. It's something we can do. This is a quote by Aaron McGrath with Audubon, New York. Um, one of the biggest issues about um, with birds is in, and the loss of birds is that it's a loss of habitat and climate change are, are two of the greatest threats to birds and involve environmental conservation and landowners across the state to conserve our natural resources for birds and people. A lot of that is working with farms uh, in, in some efforts, um, county parks, uh, a lot of different areas to really create habitat because the biggest threat to birds is loss of habitat and climate change. Two of three birds are at risk for extinction. That's just an astounding number. And I think people have heard a lot about that we've lost a billion birds. Um, it's it's just so heartbreaking to me. And we need birds, we need them to thrive and survive. And, and we need them, so, so do people, we need to thrive and survive. And basically what's good for birds is good for people. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. This is helping ourselves basically with, with helping the birds. So um, what to me, one of the most fascinating things about birding and why it's so important with creating habitat is that we basically have birds from Central and South America and the Southern United States that come up here uh, in, the, to, in the spring to nest uh, in New York, uh, well, all over the place, uh, in the spring and summer, and or they migrate south from more Northern climates that, um, for winter or overwintering in New York. And with climate change, some birds are arriving earlier than uh, um, earlier in the spring. And it's just so important to maintain these habitats for, for the, all of this. And the disruptions from climate change, um, there's been droughts. I think we've all been very aware of all the things going on with the false spring. Uh, that's when things, you know, you'll have a heat wave in, in like February and buds will come out and, and then, you know, it really messes up the plants and spring heat waves. We had some, it was pretty hot last spring and that really affects um, how birds are gonna be uh, affected. Um, there's the fires and all the weather changes, the heavy rain, you know, and flooding and then increasing uh, lake level rise, sea level rise. And the timing mismatch has to do with um, the, 
the the way like I alluded to about um, if there's an uh, budding that occurs early, then then it's it's a timing mismatch for the plants. And just also some of the birds are arriving earlier, and the plants that they depend on are are not uh, at, uh, blooming at that time or, or or opening up at that time. The other thing is the human disturbances. Well, of course, climate change is human disturbance, but it's the Anthropocene era with urbanization, development, and monoculture and big agriculture. Um, big agriculture is a big issue because uh, the pesticides they use, and also it's just they take away a lot of habitat that had been very useful to, to for, and all this land is being utilized for things that don't really. Uh, help birds at all. Um, birds keep our ecosystem in balance. They're pollinators, they, they disperse seeds, they, they scavenge car carcasses, recycle nutrients. And I like to think of how they affect our human ecosystem. And that I, I don't know about you, but watching birds, it reduces my stress. It makes me very joyful. It can even increase mental clarity. And I, I noticed a couple of years ago when I was out birding, sometimes I was just kind of grinning because I just felt happy being out there. And, you know, when you get on a good bird or you just see different things, it's amazing. So getting started, how do you get, how do you go about this? It seems a little overwhelming, but one of the first things you do is just kind of see what you have, taking inventory. And if, if you can, you want to plan for year round planting. One of the big issues is going native. Uh, there's been a lot about this, and it, it is a critical part of birding of your your garden, bird, bird friendly gardens. Um, the, you want to have flowers, shrubs, trees, and vines if you can. And one of the critical issues is no pesticides, and I'll talk more about that. But but that's a huge issue. And I know when I was starting my garden, um, it was this big weedy area, and my you know, my husband was about to go out there with all this roundup and I was like, no, it's a bird friendly garden. We can't do that. So uh, you have to think of it constantly that you want to really have no pesticides around because it, 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 it kills birds, basically. Um, so you want to leave some of your good weeds. Uh, you want to get rid of invasives. That's a biggie because a lot of the invasives crowd out the natives and 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 also some of them just have certain toxins. Uh, so you really want to get rid of your invasives. I'll go into that. Lawns, there's a bit of a wasteland to birds, but um, but you know, they, they do have some use. Uh, let it be permission to be messy with having some brush piles, leaving some of your leaf litter. Caterpillars breed in, in leaf litter. So you don't want to just wipe out everything. I get a little nuts hearing all these these um, blowers, go leaf blowers, because they're, to me, they're just wiping out habitat. Um, and I'll talk some about feeders, birdhouses, and bird baths. And I just want to look, everyone to look at the big picture of creating and maintaining habitat in your backyard, but also being aware of conservation uh, efforts in general so that you can best help uh, birds. So how to create a, a bird-friendly habitat? You want to think like a bird. They need water, food, shelter, and nesting ability. So think like a bird, water. Uh, you want to provide for year-round drinking and bathing. So for a lot of birds, um, like I, I finally got a, a heated uh, bird bath for in the winter. And I've seen robins, which never come to my, um, my back deck, but they'll come for water <laughs> that in, in the winter. And, um, you know, butterflies go there, hummingbirds, you know, having clean water, you know, you want to clean out your bird baths and such, but you want to have some sort of water element uh, in your garden. So you can, if you're, you know, if you have a nice pond and you have sort of, you know, or you can make smaller um, uh, things like this, but having some sort of water source is a pretty elaborate. You can have a simple bubbler. Um, Birds are attracted to moving water. So you really want to, uh, the bubblers are really nice to have. Um, you know, this is some, this doesn't really have the water moving. It should, it doesn't look like it's turned on, but uh, you know, you want moving water. This is the, sorry, the, the, the bird bath looks a little dirty, but it's kind of rusted. But, but the water wiggler um, is added to the bird 
bath and it keeps the water moving and, and it can prevent mosquitoes. I know a lot of people get concerned about standing water, which we should be. Of course, mosquitoes or birds eat them, but, um, but you know, that's one, one simple way you can get moving water. And, you know, just having a bird bath out in the yard again, keep it clean, keep it filled. Um, and this is just one of the community gardens here in Croton. And you see that bird bath in the background and, uh, you know, so, but it takes maintaining. Everything is maintaining. Gardens take maintaining. Everything does. Um, so think like a bird. What food are they going to eat? What kind of things do you plant to provide that? There's, they need, you know, different birds eat seeds, fruits, berries, nuts, and insects. So how do you provide that in your garden? So seeds, black-eyed Susans are just one of the greatest things you can plant. Um, I'm going to go into real specifics on, on um, the really exceptional plants a little bit later. Um, echinacea and purple cornflower, and then you have to see a monarch on that. I think these are some gardens I was in. I took these pictures. Um, sunflowers are just fabulous. I, I have trouble growing sunflowers because my squirrels dig up the seeds, but um, not sure what to tell you about that. But sunflowers are great for birds, you know, with all the in the center, all the seeds. And then fruits, you know, apples. Um, uh, they, they love, we had an apple tree. Uh, it's, you know, we don't have any more, sadly, but um, this was a picture when we did have one. Uh, this is showing like a Baltimore Oriole and, you, you know, and sometimes putting oranges out. And um, they really like apple blossoms. I came home from work one day and my husband had seen all these beautiful Baltimore Orioles just feasting on our apple blossoms when we had an apple tree and it was just astounding and you know they just eat the blossoms that you know whole um mulberry tree I actually we lost our mulberry tree in a storm but but you know we're got other things up um cherry trees are really birds love cherries um and then talking about berries um Raspberries, they're, uh, they really love the different berries. A lot of these grow wild. Um, if you are planting them and you're trying to save them for yourself, it's not a really good idea to put the netting over them because birds can get caught in that and it could kill them. <laughs> so if you're gonna plant berries, you have to be prepared that they are gonna eat them, <laughs> which is what we want. <laughs> Um, this is a mockingbird. Actually, in the background, though, I'm a little embarrassed. That's a porcelain berry. Um, I took this down in an area in the village, but I love mockingbirds, so I wanted him in there. Um, grapes. They, you know, a lot of people have grapes that they're able to grow. Um, one of my favorite things for birds is a service berry. Um, the the um, the cedar waxwings are crazy about them, and uh, it's a really great. Um, you know, plant for that. I was down in Croton Landing here, Croton on Hudson, and they were, I, I was just watching them just, there were 20 of them in a one, one tree just feasting. It was so fun. And that's just the service berry. Um, and nuts, of course, your acorns are your classic uh, nuts that are available. Of course, your walnuts, all different nuts are good. Birds like them. Native oak trees are just one of the most fabulous things to plant. Um, they host more than 530 species of caterpillars and insect species, and they provide excellent nesting for birds. Um, the way their branches are, certain, you know, the way birds can build their nests in a crook, it's uh, kind of safer for the bird. And um, that's a, a really important thing to note. Um, and turkeys love acorns, also blue jays and woodpeckers. So you will we'll really enjoy those. Insects. This is the biggest part of bird, uh, what we need to provide for uh, birds and, and the type of plants that attract them in bird-friendly gardens. And just to say, I'm talking about bird-friendly gardens, but basically a lot of the same plants po for pollinators are really good for birds. And a lot, of course, we're talking about natives and as much as we can. And this is just showing a bee. Um, good bugs to have in your garden, your, your, um, your ladybug. And then you see a wren 
that's a house wren with a worm in its mouth. And then you're seeing a cat bird on the lower right with a worm in its, or a caterpillar in its mouth. And cicadas are kind of good. Um, they'll, they'll eat those when they come out. And uh, there was, and, and again, no insecticides. There was that big, you know, there's 17 year eruptions of cicadas. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're underground and then they come out and there were just so many of them. It was deafening down in, like Virginia and Pennsylvania and stuff, but, um, and people were doing all these insecticides and then it was, you know, the, the, the cicadas are gonna dry pretty quickly anyway. And um, they went all crazy spraying these poor cicadas and then um, the birds were eating them and then it was killing the birds. And everyone was like, what's happening? Why are all these birds dying? It's because the cicadas were, were being sprayed. So birds eat insects. 96% of birds depend on insects to feed their young, mainly caterpillars. Insects are pollinators. We do not want to do pesticides. Again, that hurts our insects. That's the biggest cause of, of uh, insects dying off. Uh, cicadas and pesticides, I've talked about that. And I'm just going to mention no black boxes. Um, they're, they're used for, uh, you know, usually when you hire a pest company, they have a rat poison is in in this black box and um, it the and the a rodent will will consume it and then kind of crawl away and then if the a raptor sees that 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 uh, rodent it'll eat it and then the raptor dies so we really don't want to have these um, these these around um, so just showing some other. Uh, insects on plants, um, daddy long legs, um, spiders are actually, wrens eat a lot of spiders, <laughs> and just different beetles are really important, um, and different butterflies, which we're seeing on our, our flowers. So again, think like a bird, uh, shelter and nesting. If you don't have breeding birds, you won't have feeding birds. So uh, doing the plants that have um, that that are are uh, that can provide for um, caterpillars is is just super important. So these are some nests just in my carport. Um, there's actually there's two there. One is on the Fios box and one is up on the eaves up there. Uh, it's a little close up. They're kind of messy. I think that was a, a sparrow nest. And this is just showing birds with um, some nesting material. And then on the right, you see, well, my right, uh, I see a bluebird feeding uh, its young. I just love that. And then you see a cardinal feeding um, their young. And I, I had cardinals in my yard and it, it was just so wonderful to feel I, I, they wanted me, <laughs> you know, that they were, that they had a nest here. They were just so beautiful to watch. And um, getting started, um, you want to assess your type of habitat. Um, you want to get rid of um, invasives, knotweed, Japanese honeysuckle, bittersweet, English ivy, Japanese barberry. Notice they all have foreign names in them. Um, I think it's Japanese bittersweet too. Um, you know, they're, they're anything with a foreign name in it is obviously not native. And um, I can't stress enough getting rid of natives, I mean, of getting rid of invasives, excuse me, uh, because they're, they're just, they can mess up your other plants, basically, and sometimes they overcompete and they can um, take out, uh, they, they, they'll maybe cover up and provide shade, and so the other, the natives don't have a chance to grow. So um, looking at your property and trying to plant for uh, year round um, so that some things have seed heads or different things in the winter, maybe different berries uh, may be left on the trees, but you want to plant for year round uh, to have a, and it's just interesting to look at, you know, if you have different things going on, different parts of the year. So here's a wonderful meadow um, and Meadows are just wonderful for birds and, and insects. That's where I was just over at a, uh, um, up at a friend's yes, uh, yesterday. They, they had intent, did these intentional planting of meadows. They were just beautiful. And you just saw all the butterflies and different insects and bees. And, you know, they were just um, 
they were so it it really produces insects, and you would see birds flying over uh, getting the insects. This is my garden. It's a little more overgrown than this, but I just kind of um, it's part of it's covered up with my but um, it it was just laid out in. Um, with you know I had Joe pie weed and I have service berry and I had the butterfly weed not butterfly bush butterfly weed is the net native and just different uh things that um that, you know I try I didn't it, it's not all totally native because this was a number of years ago and I I'm always learning things but um but anyway so you know you can just this is my backyard um and your garden you know, in thinking about your planting, you want to plant flowers, shrubs, trees, and vines. And um, those are the important things to, to look at um, because they're different levels and they provide different things. Some, some birds will nest in shrubs, uh, they're lower or they're ground nesters. They, they are in the ground tucked into a shrub, some nest in trees summer and vines so and then the flowers that pr produce food so those are the different things you need to think about so flowers that attract insects is very important uh, sedum goldenrod yarrow and aster are some of the really good ones and um uh i this is from doug Tallamy and talking about um, the keystone plants, you know, a keystone is that part of the, an arch that kind of holds everything together. And if you, you remove that middle piece, everything falls apart. And um, these are, these keystone plants support 90% of the caterpillars. Uh, and caterpillars are what birds mainly eat. Uh, well, fledglings, uh, young birds baby birds. So um, oaks are the most wonderful. They they have 557 species of caterpillars. I've mentioned this already in the ta talk, but uh, it's just so extraordinary to me. Uh, willow, uh, 456 species. And the flowers that are really great for supporting uh, caterpillars are sunflower, aster, goldenrod, evening primrose, fleabane and violets. These are the these are the ones that mainly um, support uh, caterpillars. So just showing some of these flowers. Um, and and talking about hedgerows, um, hedgerows, the you know farms, smaller farms used to have hedgerows. And it's like a magic hedge is what it's called. And it's so neat because you know it provides food, shelter, and nesting sites, and that's one of the things that's a shame with um, with having the you know agri you know the big ag and these huge monoculture um, farms is that you don't have the food and shelter and nesting sites because farms used to be lined with hedgerows on either side and. It was a really special thing. I I was out in Ohio and in Indiana and Ohio, yeah, near in Indiana also, but there were a lot of Amish and they still plant this way. They do like sustainable farms. And um, it's really important with your, uh, to have hedgerows if you can have them in any way. This is actually not a hedgerow, it sort of is. It's mainly like some overgrown vines, I think. That's not a true hedgerow. But, you know, this does provide, this is on a park in Croton along the river, and it can provide, um, you know, some shelter and nesting and such. Trees are what are really so special for birds. We all know about our nests and such, but, the food they provide, the, the seeds, berries, and nuts. Um, the What is really fun to watch is uh, birds that are in the, in the crevices uh, hunting for insects. Um, and they also provide nesting sites and nesting material. And we saw some birds with holding nesting material in their beaks. And the bark crevices for 
insects, your nuthatches and your different woodpeckers and different bird, your creepers, they, they literally go up and down the trunk of a, of a tree to look for insects. So here's a woodpecker feeding on insects in um, a bird crevice. And, you know, it's really neat to me. It's, it's tongue sticks out, um, uh, extends beyond the bill and that's what it's uh, working with. And this is a juniper, a tree that you know it has these or shrub rather it has these wonderful berries that are good um these are birch trees and their seeds have high they have high protein seeds and so that's really beneficial for for birds um vines again provide food shelter uh, nesting sites, nesting materials, and, um, you know, they can look really pretty and um, uh, in, in your garden. So some of our natives that birds really love, and it's not so loved by people, but is uh, poison ivy and sumac. I wouldn't quite recommend, I don't know, if you want poison ivy in your garden, but um, this is along an area along the river, um, but it birds love this and it is native. And also Virginia creeper, which kind of the end of summer when this it's turning orange like this is indicating towards the end of summer. And this is also a native and birds really like it. It, it has little berries in it. So the whole point of going native with your plants is, is that I, I talked about this before, but I'm stressing it again, is that 96% of baby birds require insect larvae as food. And 90% of insect larvae, uh, larvae require leaves or other uh, parts of indigenous plants for, for laying, um, you know, for, for their growth. And another tree to mention that um, ha supports a lot of species is the hawthorn, which has a 159 species of uh, butterflies and moths that it can support. So these kinds of trees, these kind of mega um, larvae uh, 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 bird uh, trees, you know, they they provide such a um, it's an important uh, source. So berries from native plants provide better nutrition. They're higher in fat. And so you'll see like in the spring, I mean, in the fall, you'll see birds kind of gearing up for migration. You know, they're, they're going back to their winter breeding areas. And um, it's, it's just incredible. And they need things that are high in nutrition uh, because they'll do these incredible flights. I mean, birds will migrate across the Gulf of Mexico. They'll migrate all up the coast of the Eastern coast. Um, it's just extraordinary to me how the, or there's birds that migrate from like the Arctic to the Antarctic, you know, to Tierra del Fuego. It's just extraordinary to me. And so they, they really need to have um, plants that provide them with high fat contact, good nutrition. And fledglings have a better chance of survival when nests are located in native plants. Some of it it, it, for a number of factors, the way the nests are built, the way the trees branches are shaped, and also a lot of the food they need are um, are is right there. You know, if they're the caterpillars are being produced that in that tree, like in an oak tree, and or a hawthorn, or you know, it's um, it's really and it's safer for the birds also because then the parent bird is not off and way yonder getting food and leaving the nest unprotected because there's so many predators. I, I mean, it's a wonder to me how birds survive with all the, all the difficulties, you know, um, it's, it, it's really something. And, you know, they do, birds basically have two um, uh, clutches a year, uh, you know, in the spring, uh, they usually are nesting in June and then You'll hear a lot of racket with birds in the um, in the spring because they're attracting mates and 
doing their sound territories and, you know, sound fences, they call it, uh, establishing territory. And then they get quiet when they're on the nest. They don't want to attract any attention. And um, except the cardinals I had, they were making such a racket when the fledglings were in there. Um, I was like worried about them. But um, they, and then they'll go and uh, they usually use the same nest, but then they'll go out and then, you know, they may use the same mate or they may have a different one, depends on the bird and um, they'll do a second nest. So that's really, um, so the, so when it's in a native tree, they just have a better chance of survival because there's so many predators and uh, the bird is protecting um, their, their eggs. So these are different uh, berries that um, that are good for birds. And this is a swallowtail caterpillar. And this is, you know, just one of the caterpillars that, that birds really love to eat. This is, I think it's so cool looking. Um, now talking about hummingbirds, we all love our hummingbirds. So if you want hummingbirds, you want flowers that are tubular, red, and oriented horizontally. And plants that attract hummingbirds are columbines, trumpet vine, bee balm, salvia. There's others, but those are, are the ones um, that are uh, really good for birds. Um, uh, oh, there's, there's, there's others too. Um, uh, some of the vines uh, are, are really good for, uh, for uh, hummingbirds. And if you're going to do feeders, you got to keep them clean. You have to change that the sugar water. It's a one to four solution. you got to change it every uh, two or three days uh, because mold forms in it. And if you're not going to make that commitment to change it, don't do it because you're going to do more harm than good. You have to keep them clean. You have to clean them out. Don't use that red stuff. You don't need it. It's just a one to four. Like I use half a cup of sugar and then two cups of water and I mix it up and, um, you know, uh, keep that ready. And I change my feet. I don't fill them, you know, I just do it a little bit cause I'm going to be changing them all the time and keeping them clean. And you really need to check on them because the ants get in them and just different things. But, but I have had some hummingbirds at my feeders and it's really fun to watch. And they, they sometimes come to the door. They're very curious birds and rather fearless. And, and my, my, my sister-in-law is Native American. She said that, that they're blessing you when they come to your uh, door like that or they come to your window. Um, so here's the ruby-throated hummingbird. It's the only hummingbird um, east of the Mississippi. Um, uh, the other hummingbirds are out west in Arizona, New Mexico. I've seen them out there. Just uh, uh, my, I have a friend I stay with, and she's got about three or four kinds of hummingbirds. You know, Rufus, the black shrimp, chin. But the ruby-throated is the only one that's out in the, in the uh, here. And some of them, every once in a while, you get uh, something that goes off track, and you'll have a uh, different kinds of hummingbirds, but that's unusual. Um, so good weeds, you know, thistle, dandelion, jewelweed, mullein, crabgrass, poison ivy, these are good weeds, you know. So again, I'm not sure what to tell you about poison ivy. I'm very allergic to it, so I don't want it in my yard. But but thistle and dandelion, you know, jewelweed, and jewelweed is pretty. Um, here's jewelweed. Um, and uh, I think that's, is that Giro? And then um, talking about lawns. Um, there are some seeds in insects and lawns. You don't want to use pesticides. Um, you want to mow mulch if you can, you know, where there's certain um, types of mowers you can get that kind of mulches it and leaves it in. You don't have to rake it up. And that's good for the soil. It's good for the birds. Uh, don't cut it too short. There's these, uh, I think it's no mow may, <laughs> where you don't, uh, you know, you, you let your grass grow out a bit. That's good for birds. That's in the spring and they could use some of that nutrition, you know, the seeds and insects that are around there. You do have worms, of course, that you see robins out on your lawn getting um, insects or getting worms. So, um, 
you know, lawns have some purpose, but a lot of people are converting their lawns to meadows and just, uh, you know, just flower beds um, because it's it's just, uh, it's not quite a wasteland, but almost. <laughs> um, I don't even want to say desert because deserts have a lot of neat plants. <laughs> um, so one thing that um, uh, is really important in gardening is uh, let it be. Leaf litter is good. Caterpillars breed in it. Leaf standing stalks, they provide seeds. Brush piles have uh, protection and nesting um, for, and discarded Christmas trees, same thing. And the thing that is really important is dead trees and hollow logs because a lot of birds are cavity nesters. So if you, they have a hollow log or, or a dead tree, they can um, do their nest. But um, like I had a pileated woodpecker in my yard. It was just beautiful, you know. Um, that's the woody woodpecker bird. <laughs> uh, or in the book I read um, by Jason McBride, the good Lord bird is a pileated uh, woodpecker. But, you know, you, you want to, if you can, you know, leave your snags around. They're, they're really good for birds. And this is just showing a bird in the winter, you know, feeding on the seed heads. And this is showing, actually, it's my backyard, <laughs> a pile of um, logs and um, some other logs. And also now to talk about feeders and birdhouses. So, oh, I love this. This is this in my backyard, and this was a wren, house wren. And um, then we have the, the little, here's the nestlings um so or fledglings and they have a special hinge on their beak that allows them to open their their beak really wide like that and that's a lot of times you can tell a young bird because it'll still have a remnant of a certain piece of tissue that allows for that unhinging so to speak um but they're just begging for food and you know they were there wide open and ready for whatever comes their way so house wrens, um, they're, they, they're fledglings, 50% of their diet is spiders. And also a lot of birds use spider webs for, um, for, for nesting materials. So, you know, if you can leave your spiders around, it's, uh, you know, at least outside, I'm not too fond of them inside, but um, it's really important uh, for birds. And um, the, the, so, um that's a really important thing with with rents um and this is just uh bird boxes with the nests in it uh, i think those are sparrow nests sparrows are just they're pretty aggressive birds and they're all over the place house sparrows there's a lot of other kinds of sparrows that are really neat but um house sparrows um you know they kind of take over with other birds but um you know, but actually they're in a little bit of decline also. So, uh, our earth. Um, so these are just, uh, some birds are kind of platform or, 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 um, or they feed on the ground, ground feeders. So having a feeder like this, where it's, they can just, it's open and they can get to it. And then other birds are feeding on, um, you know, with your actual bird feeders. Uh, and, you know, there's all different kinds of seeds you can use to um, to track them. I, I didn't have a picture of a suet feeder, but suet is really great if you want to have that in addition to the plants you have that attract birds, but suet is really great. It's a lot of energy for the bird. And this is um, one of my favorite things, you know, bluebird, the bluebird is our the New York State bird, and this, when they start, they were declining, and they started establishing bluebird boxes, and um, it helped restore them. You know, with uh, they have bluebird trails, and then also uh, this on the left, uh, those gourd-like things are, are um, purple martin uh, nest boxes, and they're really important also because. Um, Actually, purple martins have come to depend on them. It goes back to when Indians used to use them on the edge of crops and uh, they would eat the insects and it would help with the crop growth. And um, they kind of expect them. So 
you know, there's people are doing more and more with the Purple Martins. And I, I, I helped with the um, setting up a Purple Martin nest and also bluebird boxes and some other nest boxes at this park here in Croton. And to, to track Purple Martins, you have to go down at six o'clock in the morning and play the dawn song. So I would play, go down and play this recording of, of the Purple Martin. And, you know, for an oh, hour or so, <laughs> I drink my tea. And uh, one day I, I heard one and I was just so excited. And um, I found out later that a mockingbird had picked up the Purple Mountain Purple Martin song because I had um, played it so much. And anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. But then actually Purple Martins did come. It was very exciting. I'm so happy about that. They didn't actually nest this year, but they were checking it out because they are desperate. You know, birds are desperate for our help. They need, that's why we need, you know, with the feeding and with the protection and bird boxes it's and nesting boxes, it's just so important because they just need it. So um, just a little overview of other things, what you can do to help birds, um, backyard habitat, bird-friendly gardens we talked about. I know this is a touchy subject, but outdoor cats kill a billion birds annually. And I'm not against cats. But I've had outdoor cats, um, but they I didn't realize how much they did. And um, if you can keep them indoors, then it's safer for the birds too. I mean, for the for the cat. Preventing window strikes, that's a whole talk in itself, but it's just when, you know, birds will sometimes crash into your window or deck door or something. So if you can put up screens, that can really help um, preventing bird strikes. Sometimes those little decals and hanging things don't really help as much as you think they would. Supporting dark skies and lights out initiatives. That's a huge thing. I don't know if any others have noticed it, but you know, you don't see as many um, uh, fireflies. Um, we just, are, we have so many lights on. We have these big floodlights. What are we afraid of? I mean, so many lights are on. And uh, I guess here in Croton, you know, Metro North is nearby, which, you know, is safety issues, of course. Um, but, you know, it's um, lights out. Uh, initiatives go on uh, where you have a night where you just, you know, really try and turn out all the lights in your house. Uh, and uh, dark skies initiatives where uh, there's certain ways you can do street lamps and things like that. It's really important. And it affects birds also with, with how they, with nesting and th such. If you can follow climate change and conservation legislation, sometimes just signing a petition or something, Actually, right now, Governor Hochul still has her um, on her desk is a, a, a bill that's about um, birds and pollinator protection. And uh, it hasn't been signed yet. It passed uh, last fall, I think. And it still needs to be signed into law. And, uh, you know, so following some of that is, um, is important. Uh, know your local area and the issues, put birds on your community agenda. I know I got involved in, um, oh, they wanted to cut down 100, tre no, 500 trees to put up bird, I uh, mean, you know, solar array, but which sounds great, but basically solar stuff should go on existing structures. You shouldn't be cutting down trees to, to um, put up solar. And uh, so, you know, we got it looked at again and and so it wasn't they they took it off <laughs> you know they they're not doing it so your voice is important um and then again no insecticides working with nesting boxes can really help birds um and some of the larger issues with you know being aware of things going on in your community uh soma river audubon is connected with um Lindhurst, and it's so amazing to me. They they have hired uh, a landscaper that is is knows bird friendly um, uh, plants and such, and is really working to redo their landscape so it's friendly to birds. And uh, it's just so exciting to me. And then we partnered with them. We do um, we do uh, tours there and go on walks and kind of connecting people because when you connect people with nature, you know they're 
concerned about birds and with, about co conservation efforts. So it's really important to be aware of these different collaborations and initiatives. One of my favorites and exciting ones to me is that the, in, in uh, uh, Croton Point Park, the restoration of the grasslands. Um, so now you have uh, grasshopper sparrows and um, kestrels and uh, Dick Cecil and Savannah sparrows. It's just like, wow, you know, this, these birds that were, and my favorite is the bobolink that migrates from Brazil, Argentina and comes here to our backyard. I mean, it's so exciting because we created a habitat that is friendly to them and it's, they're nesting there and it's just extraordinary. It's, it's so exciting. So um, build it and they will come, so to speak being aware of some of these initiatives. They had, there was some effort. They had to get rid of um, a lot of the invasives. They had to reseed it, you know, and it, it, it's so where there were some herbicide used to get rid of the, um, the invasives. So, you know, it, it can be very exciting to, to see these. And farms are doing this. There's farms that'll change what they're planting. So it's more bird friendly or leave a field fallow every other year or just rotating things. So um, your small farms do a lot of that. So I think it's important to like support them in their, you know, at the farmer's market and such because they're doing the lot, they're doing sustainability for birds. And so these are just some of our resources, you know, with Audubon, Salma River Audubon is a really good organization and I'm proud to be on the board for it. Westchester Native Plant Center, Feed the Birds. I just put, I, I love, he helps us uh, with different things in our community, supporting conservation efforts. Um, National Wildlife Federation is really a fun thing to go on to because you can make your own garden of certified wildlife habitat. I have a little sign on my yard and it's just, you know, it just encourages people to think about it. And gardenforwildlife.org, they have kids. They also under National Wildlife Federation, they have a native plant finder for your neighbor, for your area. The American Bird Conservancy is one of the best organizations I know. They're all about birds. They, they just really uh, work on that. And of course, Cornell um, is, is amazing. Um, and if you, you know, if you are into birding, if you want to do backyard bird counts, that's how kind of how I got into birding was looking at my backyard birds and then getting excited about it and then going on bird walks. So I just want to talk about in September 22nd and 24th, this kind of uh, covered up, but I have the information clearly here is um, New York State Ornithological Association Birding Conference that Sawmill River Audubon is sponsoring. And it has some big name speakers, um, uh, David Sibley, who's written many books and really had a this most recent one is how to think like a bird that reads so easily and is so interesting. And so he's going to be our main speaker um, at that. So this is one of our young birders and <laughs> it's my granddaughter. <laughs> and just thanks for listening and happy bird gardening. These are two. Um, this looks like a courtship thing where uh, it's off, off my deck where the um, the the cardinal is feed, it, the male is feeding the female. It's kind of a cheap date as far as I'm concerned because he got to see it from my feeder, but that's okay. They're getting together and that's a happy thing. So thank you. Thank you, Carrie. That was, that was great and inspiring. And um, we have a number of questions. So I'm gonna go into the chat and start. Um, feeding you the questions no no pun intended <laughs> let's see okay i think in the and and i apologize some of this may have been answered i'm gonna go um i guess earlier when you were talking about planting vines uh judy asked what kind of vines are well, good to plant gosh um I mean, there's the vine, like trumpet vines and things like that, um, that attract uh, birds, um, that attract hummingbirds mainly. Um, trying to think of other vines. Uh, uh, I have to, 
I'm not too clear on that. Okay. <laughs> Just different kinds of vines. <laughs> I'm more of a birder than an actual gardener, to be quite honest. But, okay, so I mean, Bob, obviously jump yeah. in as with your gardening expertise, but there's a question. Do you think the judicious use of herbicides can be used to eradicate knotweed as part of a comprehensive landscape reforestation effort, native plant restoration? Yeah, well, that's what we did at the Croton Grassland, you know, for the Croton Point Park. And, you know, it was, you know, you don't like to use herbicides, um, but, uh, but yeah, judiciously using them, sometimes you really need to. And another area that I, I helped work on when I was on Croton Conservation Advisory, as um, there were Phragmites that had really taken over a marshy area. And so I, you know, we did do a mitigation there, which is uh, parentheses uh, herbicides. And now we have cattails growing there and marshmallow, you know, we have native plants. So, you know, it is a balancing act sometimes. And um, so I, I think it's worth it, uh, done judiciously, yes. I think okay. judicious is the key word. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you don't go crazy with it. And there's certain, you know, you don't want to use neonicotinoids or, you know, the really bad things, but a lot of the herbicides do have less, you know, dangerous types of things that go on. <laughs> so um this is an interesting comment because I know you spoke a lot about that birds do like poison ivy, but who wants poison ivy? Uh, somebody comment that they heard birds spread poison ivy. What can be used to get rid of poison ivy? Though I don't think we really want to get rid of it because the birds like it. Oh, uh, that's a tough one. I mean, yeah, they 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 disperse seeds, and and so they're yeah they're gonna spread it. There's no question about it. Is that they, you know, because they have um, you know, they poop all over the place, and you know they're gonna spread seeds. So there's no getting around that. And I think if you have it in your yard and you don't want it, I know we pull it up in our yard uh, because I'm allergic to it. So, um, you know, we, you pre pretty much have to pull it up when you see it. Uh, somebody asked, do you have a favorite bird bath fountain bubbler to recommend? Oh gosh. Um, well, there's, there's all sorts, you know, there's these solar things that, you know, you kind of float them around and they bubble around. You can make them, you can take a big jug and just have a tiny hole and have it dripping into your bird bath. Um, I don't have a real specific one. Um, I got like a bubbler one that I, I plugged my friend Bob at Feed the Birds. He has like a bubbler sort of fountain, um, uh, uh, little bird bath, you know. Uh, just something affordable, you know, so that's what I'd go with, but I really recommend heaters, you know, to have that in the winter really helps birds, you know, to have a heated bird bath. Uh, another question, if your neighbor has an outdoor cat, should you avoid putting out feeders and boxes and boxes? Well, I, I, I have a deck and so the, you know, there's a million cats in my neighborhood, but um, it's hard and they get in my yard. I mean, I have an open yard. I mainly have my feeders on my deck and uh, I don't know, it's a balancing act. You know, there's a lot of outdoor cats and there's a lot of feral cats. Like there's a big feral cat colony up to Croton Point Park, which is disturbing because there's so many great birds there. But um I don't know. No, I I, I still feed them, <laughs> and there are there are birds in my neighborhood. I mean cats. Um, we had one comment. If everyone didn't see it, that cat cat bibs really help my cat not kill birds. So cat what? Cat bibs. I guess oh. the, the neck. Oh. It's, I I don't. Yeah. Well, there's the the bell things too that are interesting to use. So, but they they. They still can, generally. I mean, maybe that helps some, but um, they still can get to the birds. Let's see. Oh, was the purple finch gourd pole man-made or bought? Oh, the purple martin. Oh, that's that's uh, purple that's martin. Bought. Yeah, purple martin. Yeah, it's a kit, and they're not cheap. <laughs> they're about twelve hundred, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars. They're depending on how many 
how big it is and such but you know it was and it's you know installing it and everything it's kind of a big deal and like everything else you have to maintain it you have to clean it out every season you have to you know sometimes you even have to store it you know put it away um but yeah but okay. yeah you buy that it's it's i mean i guess you could make one with the gordon stick but you know <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we'll have a library program where we may. Yeah, it. giant out gourd. I mean, I have a friend who makes art in gourds, so maybe. Yeah. <laughs> ask her where she gets her gourds. <laughs> um, what's going on with the crows? I've never heard them make such a racket in my neighborhood before. Something going on with crows? Uh, I don't know. I mean, crows are just very social birds. They're they make a lot of racket. They're they're very intelligent, and they they communicate with each other and a lot of those calls are are um are uh warnings a lot of times a lot of times when they see a predator a lot of times when you see a hear a big kerfuffle of a lot of jays and 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 crows and such a lot of times it means a predator is around and so they're they're warning you uh, but they're also just very social birds they they have different calls for different things and um you know, a lot of birds are very social, black vultures, turkey vultures, they roost together and they make a lot of record thing because they're communicating within their their colony, so to speak. Our daughter is putting out food for the crows and they are bringing her presents. Oh, I've this. always wanted to do that. Yeah, <laughs> what they bring her? <laughs> uh, rock. <laughs> oh yeah, that's no, <laughs> that's really cool. They like shiny things, so I've thought about leaving out a bracelet or something. <laughs> but yeah, that's really neat. Oh, that that sounds like fun. I've thought about doing that. I haven't gotten around to it. There's a crow's nest near my, you know, one in the next yard over. There's I also a comment. Oh, sorry. Um, bears like bird feeders. Oh yeah. But what to do other than not have the bird feeder? You probably need to not have them because <laughs> they, you know, I know areas here in Croton, out in T-Town, people don't put out um, bird feeders because they've had black bears. And I, I mean, they'll come right into your porch. They, they're pretty yeah. fearless. Um, so yeah, you'd be better off not having your feeders sadly but you know sometimes more than other i mean you could have them out in the winter because they're hibernating you know it's just parts of the year that you don't put out feeders you know depending upon if how many birds are around and what the life cycle with the with the bears you know is what they're doing uh somebody asked uh whoops where'd that question go should you leave bird feeders out in the spring and summer months? You know, I do. A lot of people don't recommend it, but I, I, it's for my own selfishness. I, I like to watch them and people worry, are they going to be dependent? They aren't dependent on it. They, it's only 20% at most of their food. They forage and get it from other sources. And I think, I think it just makes less stress for them, you know, and especially in the spring, they're nesting and they're, you know, they're growing, they're, they're, they're having fledglings and such. And like this picture I have, you know, they, 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 they use it as, you know, it's important. And so I, I do feeders year round and um, I really enjoy it because I like to watch the birds, you know, so part of it's selfish, but it does help the birds also. It's a one less stress for them, you know, a little bit less foraging they have to do, you know, in the spring when they're trying to nest and mate and everything. So, and they've nest in the summer, you know, they do cl two clutches. So I, I feed them year round. There's another, I, I know this well, uh, what about squirrels raiding bird feeders? And I know there are feeders out there with squirrel prevention, but I think the squirrels always figure it out. Well, I have my feeders that I have, I have one that I'm hanging off the deck and they can't get to that one. There's also bird feeders that um, have a kind of a release that only takes a certain amount of weight. And those are, those are pretty effective, you know? So I, I would, you know you can there are uh squirrel free bird feeders i've i've been using them for years and i i mean the squirrels are out there you know they're getting the stuff that drops down or if i have some spilled seed or um they they can get to my suet actually the suet you can get with um 
you can put it like in a cage and only little birds can get in there. So, mm -hmm. um, but if you do an open sewer thing, they'll, they'll go to town with that, you know, but, you know, there, there are ways to deter them. But I like uh, squirrels too. <laughs> yeah. How to protect, I get, how do you protect bird's nest, bird eggs, and bird babies from chipmunks and rat snakes? The nest oh. is on your porch. On I don't know what to tell you. That, that's just one of those difficult um, things that, you know, the predators, they figure things out. Um, I mean, you know, if you're doing a bird's nest, you want, I mean, a bird box, a feed, a nest box, if you put it out to where it can't be reached by a squirrel, you know, with, um, you know, that can help some, you know, to really put it on the outermost part of the branch or hanging it from something else. Uh, but it's very difficult, the predators. It's, uh, I'm not sure what to say about that. <laughs> Okay, I think, uh, are there any more questions? I mean, if somebody, if you want to unmute and just ask, we can do that also. We're Well, we, we did record this session and once it's edited, we will, um, we'll send that out. And so it includes, Basically, it is Carrie's slideshow. Uh, we have a comment here to clarify the comment about Prune Sanctuary. Oh, Prine. Prine. Uh, oh, yeah, Prine Sanctuary is um, that's part of Sawmill River Audubon, and it, I meant to put more in the actual slideshow. It's actually they have a pollinator garden. They do. They have a, a meadow that uh, with native grasses and. Uh, there's a lot of information on the Soma River Audubon website about native plants and about native grasses and pollinator gardens and such, because that is part of our mission, so to speak. So I should have given more of a shout out to that. So thank yeah, you. Yes, so this, this must be one of your- um, <laughs> One of my buddies. Yeah. Yeah. They, they're right. We do have two mostly native gardens there. One is a demonstration meadow garden with combinations of plants and grasses that work in our areas. So it sounds like a, a worthwhile visit to- Yeah. Oh, it's a one. Really and they have a whole area you can walk in also that has a meadow and it has, you know, uh, uh, marshy areas. It's a really beautiful bird walk. Okay. And now we're getting- Many thank yous from many people. So <laughs> I, I think yes. that's it for the questions. And I know we've gone a little bit over the hours. So thank you so much. This was wonderful. We had a really robust attendance. So thank you to all my fellow li libraries for you know getting it out there. And Carrie, you know, you shared it with the um, Audubon and Bob with Healthy Yards. So it's great to really bring our community together this way and learn how we can help our feathered friends. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lisa, partner libraries, Carrie, and, and everyone for uh, participating. Thank you very much. And, and stay tuned for, for more programs with uh, with us and, and Healthy Yards and Audubon. I mean, this happens to be a personal favorite of mine. So we're, we're going to be talking <laughs> about what else we might do. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll, we'll get out thank the you. presentation.